are grateful for the service of all of our veterans who have sacrificed in order to defend the freedoms that we enjoy. And uh, if you're here this morning and you have served in the armed forces of the United States, I'd like to ask you to please stand at this time so we can express our thanks. So veterans, don't be shy, please stand. a number of families in our church who have traveled the journey of adoption and I'd like to invite one of them to come and and share with us this morning and so I need a favor please come and share your family story with us thank you pastor Tom good morning I'm gonna try to do this without crying but I probably won't be able to that was my dad's prayer this morning that I could do it without crying and of course, now I will. So I'm going to grab this stand. So as Pastor Tom said, my name is Anita Faber. And my husband is Kevin. And today he got to hide in the back room to run live stream. So he did not have to be out here. And our son is Micah. And Micah is in the nursery. So. We have a very incredible adoption story. Many of you know it, some of you may not. Um, and it started way back when Kevin and I started dating specifically. We had talked about where we wanted our family to go, what we thought children might look like, and we were both open to adoption. Never, ever, ever thinking that I wouldn't be able to get pregnant and have biological children of our own. God had other plans, because of course, never got pregnant, married 17 years, no children. So imagine for a moment, 3,650 days, 87,600 hours of prayer. That is how long Kevin and I prayed from 2010 to 2020 for a child to be placed into our home. Now those numbers are rough guesses, but that is about 10 years worth of prayer. So after struggling for many years of infertility and trying to get pregnant, Kevin and I sought out adoption through Bethany Christian Services. And when we met with them the first time, we were like, yes, we're gonna do this. And we started doing our home studies and we started doing letters. And after a few months, we were like, you know, we're just not at peace with this. This just is not what God has called us to do in this manner. So we decided to put adoption on hold. We shared with our church at that time. Thank you, David. And this was the picture that we shared of our family when we started the adoption process back in 2010. Fast forward to 2014. We are here at this church. We've been attending here since uh, 2004, and we joined in 2014 our student ministry under Ray Dutcher. We, I was a small group leader of our girls. Kevin is a small group leader of our boys. And after a few months of being involved in that ministry, I just started to feel a real sense of peace that this is what God was doing to answer that prayer of children. Those teens, the teens of this church, became our kids. We still call them our kids. And I look across the sanctuary and I see many of you here today. You were our kids and you will always be our kids. God used you to answer that prayer in our hearts. But he was still working. There was a teen in that ministry back in 2014 who I got to know very well. She became the birth mom of our son, Micah. He, Micah was born in June of 2018, and his grandparents started bringing him to this church. If you don't know, his grandparents are Rich and Rochelle Schaefer. They also are not here today, but I know they're watching online. So as Rochelle would bring him to church, I got to hug him, I got to love him, not knowing what God was doing, doing in the lives of Rich and Rochelle and their family, but also doing in the lives of Kevin and I. One day, 
I get a Facebook message from Rochelle, and it just asks, are you going to be at church tonight? It was on a Wednesday, the Wednesday right after Thanksgiving. And I, of course, said, yeah, why, what's up? She said, Rich and I would like to talk to you. Okay. We were clueless as to what they were going to talk to us about. There are many of you in the sanctuary who knew exactly what they were going to talk to us about. You had been praying. You had been counseling. Good job at keeping a secret, too, because <laughs> we had no idea. So that night, after student ministry, we met them downstairs, and they have Micah, and we're leaving for vacation the next morning, and I had told Richard and Michelle, we don't have a lot of time. We still have to go home and pack. Rochelle's like, okay, we'll just get to the point. We want you to adopt Micah. Whoa, wait a minute, what? And I looked around the table. Kevin was crying, Rich was crying, Rochelle was crying, and I'm like, hold on, what? You're kidding, right? And then I'm like, wait a minute, that's not something you kid about. Seriously, she goes, yes, yeah, seriously. We have been working with the mom, and it's just not looking like she's going to be able to mom Micah. But you and Kevin can. Okay, so we go home that night. I call my mom, pull her out of choir because it's Christmas season. Tell my mom, hey, by the way, we're leaving, I know, but uh, we just were asked to adopt a baby. I think my mom dropped the phone on the floor. We continued to pray. We leave for vacation. We tell the rest of our family, immediate family, and we spent hours and hours and hours praying together as a family for that next 10 days. We come home, and on that Monday, I text Rochelle and I say, yes, yes, we will pursue adoption. Yes, we will pursue adopting Micah. We didn't know what the rest of the future looked like. You can show the next picture. This was our first Sunday with him. This is December 16, 2018. After church that day, we took him home. We took him to see our family. We took him to see my gra our grandparents, our parents. We got to spend the day with him. He was just six months old at the time. We had many roadblocks, and there were many days that I just cried, not thinking the adoption was going to happen. But God continued to work. 17 months. 17 months. But May 19, 2020, during a global pandemic, in a very chaotic world, I got an email from the Ottawa County Court saying that the judge had finally seen in our favor, and he signed the adoption decree. Micah J. Faber was finally ours. You can show the next picture. That 17 months was not without its bumps, but God was working the entire time. God was working in us. God was working in our families. And God was working in the lives of everybody that Micah came into contact with. God not only strengthened our marriage, but he strengthened our relationships with him. My relationship with God, Kevin's, and so on. We continually prayed for Micah, who at, during that 17 months we shared custody of. They were the guardians, and then we got visitation, basically, is how we worded that. Um, let's see. We didn't know how long the process would take, but we knew we would fight however long it took for Micah to become ours, and finally he did. The verse through the process that I clung to was 1 Samuel 1.27. It says, For I have prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. Back in September of 2018, Micah was born. I had a conversation with God, and I said, God, you're not taking this desire away, so I'm going to start praying differently. I'm going to start praying that you answer the prayer, bring a child into our life, but, you know, because I'm so cool, I'm going to also pray for a boy. Let's see how you can do. Well, God is like, ha-ha, joke's on you. I already have a boy lined up for you. So 
we get our mic up. God, or Kevin and I had been praying for this child. Never in our wildest dreams did we think that that prayer would get answered. 17 years of marriage, God answers our prayer. And we have a beautiful, now, two-and-a-half-year-old little boy. We are so thankful that his mom, his birth mom, chose life. And without her, we wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be up here sharing this story with you. Many of you have loved Micah from the moment you found out that his mom was pregnant, myself included. Birth mom has always been in my prayers, when she was a teen and to this day. Many of you have also loved on Kevin and I, long before we had a child, but then when you found out about Micah, you've been praying for us and our little family. So this is a very condensed version of our adoption story. And if you are interested in knowing more or just wanting to hear about Jesus, I love talking about Jesus and I love talking about our adoption story, please seek me out. If I may, I just have three quick prayer requests that I'd like to share. And the first is to pray for Bio Mom. She's an important piece of our story. Without her, again, I would not be here. Um, also pray for Micah. We want him to grow up to know how much he is loved by us by his family, by his church, and by God. We want him to know who God is at a very young age to put his trust and faith in Jesus. And then pray for our entire family. We may have adopted a little boy, but we gained an entire family that we're loving to get to know. So please pray for us. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. It's great to see you. I love to... Uh, just consider the thoughts in that song and the thoughts that Anita has shared on behalf of Kevin and herself. Life is a beautiful gift from God. Every life is a beautiful gift from God. The scripture says that we were made in God's image. Let us never take that for granted. Let us never take that for granted. God creates people in his image, in his likeness. And we are called to bring honor and glory to the one who has made us. Every life matters to God. And so it's, it's important on, on a weekend and a season in which we celebrate adoption, in which we also want to encourage those who are facing really challenging life decisions. Life is a beautiful gift from God. And we want to help walk with you in whatever path you find yourself in this morning. Um, it is important because scripture calls us to love one another calls us to love our neighbor as ourselves and in doing so we love the lord our god with all of our heart soul mind and strength and love sometimes <laughs> i said this in a wedding a couple days ago that i was officiating love is sometimes thought to be a feeling or an affirmation of someone's perspective but love at its core is desiring and acting with god's best for someone without having a personal or prideful motivation because see the thing about love is this love is lived in the context of relationship wherever you are on your faith journey we desire to walk with you and together learn and live for the glory of god and that's why we have a life team we want to walk with people who've who've had a past or who are facing challenging conversations right now we want them to know we want you to know that god loves you he dearly loves you and god has purposes and plans for your life and so Welcome to First Baptist Church. My name is Jeremy. By the way, I'm uh, the privilege of being the senior pastor here, and we are opening the book of Romans today. So if you've grabbed your Bibles, hope you brought one with you. If you're at home, I hope you have one nearby. Turn in your scripture to Romans 14. Um, one of the challenging things with love and loving is that um, living out love in a community of diverse people can, be get, can get really sticky really quickly. Um, relationships in other words are, are complicated uh many of you probably have been able to you know uh follow this uh we live in a world that has a little bit of division in it right there's just a little bit of division in it and, and uh we find it in politics and we find it in schools we find it in churches we find it in our families and paul is going to be talking about what does it mean to love one another and how do we live in liberty while also caring for those around us and so um paul, paul does this all in a certain context and i want to give you the context before we go look at some of the specifics and you, you might be thankful to hear this 
or maybe not, but I, I was working on the sermon and just in the last couple of days, I was like, mm, I need to break this up into two parts. And so what I was going to cover today is all of Romans 14. You can take a deep breath. We're not going to do that, but we're going to cover the first half of it. And we're going to give the context that we find in Romans 15 that gives meaning to Romans 14. And we'll pick up the second half of Romans 14 next week. Um, but, but what I want you to see is something really important. And it's actually in Romans 15. Romans 15. Look, look with me, please, here in verse 5. In verse 5, Paul says this. He says, Now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement allow you to live in harmony with one another, according to the command of Christ Jesus, so that you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with a united mind and voice. Therefore, he says, accept one another, just as the Messiah also accepted you to the glory of God. He says, For I say that the Messiah became a servant of the circumcised on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises to the forefathers, or to the fathers, and so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. The picture he's giving here is he's giving an instruction to a church that is multi dimensional, it's multi um, lingual, it's filled with a whole bunch of different background believers. He's writing to a church that comes from part Jewish background believer and part Roman background believer. And how do you put two people who grow up in different contexts and you put them together and they have the same mind and the same heart? It's a challenge. And that's what he's addressing in Romans 14. But I want you to see this because Romans 14 goes directly into Romans 15 and it's tied together by verse 7 when it says, therefore, accept one another. Now we're going to look at that word accept because we find it in the first verse of Romans chapter 14. All right. Um, but, but it's really important for us to just take pause right before that. He says so that you may glorify the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ with a united mind and with the united voice. We live in a world of division, but God has called his people, his people, that's who this is addressed to, to have a united mind and voice. Um, when I was, well, I guess it was a couple years ago, um, I had the opportunity to co-lead a trip to North Africa. And one of our purposes of this trip, and a couple of you uh, in this room were with me on that trip, it was a good time. Um, one of our purposes was to go to a local church in this country in North Africa and to lead a church retreat, basically. And so we, we studied the disciples' prayer. We provided children's ministry. We also provided um, worship ministry. Brian and some of our team were there with us. But one of the incredible things I got to experience while we were in North Africa is we went to a congregation, followers of Jesus, who came from different backgrounds. You know, some of them were native to the country in which we were at. Some of them were Westerners. Some of them were from Eastern Europe. Some of them were from Western Europe. Some of them were from Africa. There was a guy there from South Africa. There's, there's people there. I believe there was an Australian there too. You, you had in this local congregation of which the Christian denomination is not a significant population percentage of this country. You, you found people with a whole bunch of differing backgrounds, it, you know, one of the things I, I experienced was when you have a brother or sister in Christ, man, it is just good to be together. Even if you come from different vantage points. The senior pastor of this church came from one theological tradition, evangelical. Another, uh, the, the youth pastor of this church came from a different theological tradition. And the head elder came from a different yet theological tradition. Just imagine this kind of putting all these things together. One of the things, though, in this country is you don't take fellow believers for granted, as maybe we sometimes do. Because when you're there and you are a small minority of the population, when they're filled with a whole bunch of different um, groups of people who do not follow Jesus, you find that follower of Jesus, you go, we are together. We are together. And I want you to kind of have that image in your mind because think about the Roman church. It's a mixture, Jewish background, believers in the Messiah, Jesus, Gentile background, believers 
in the Messiah Jesus, and how do we put these things together within a Roman context that is incredibly pagan? We sometimes forget this context because we live in a Bible belt where you can have all, oh, here you're Baptist, and here's your Reformed, and here's your Christian Reformed, and you just kind of go down the line. The picture here is you know Jesus or you don't know Jesus. And Paul is talking to the people who know Jesus, and he's trying to give them right instruction in the Word of God. Paul has the same end in mind, Romans 15, 6, to glorify God with a united mind and with a united voice, and he wants to kind of get rid of some of these threats to unity. And so Paul has already come, and he's, he's explained in his letter, the first couple chapters, we are all dead in our transgressions and sins. Right? We, we all face a sentence of condemnation because we are sinners, and we cannot save ourselves. And yet God has justified us through the death and the burial and the resurrection of his son, Jesus. He's brought life in his name. And then he goes to the next few chapters, chapter 6 through 8 of Romans, and he talks about now, as a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit in you to lead and to guide and to equip you for everything you need for holy living. All right? He goes and he talks about how his promises to Israel, they will come to fruition, Romans 9, 10, and 11. Romans chapter 12, he comes and he says, therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercy, because every one of us has experienced God's mercy. He says, I want you to offer yourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. I don't want you to be conformed to the way that this world works. Rather, I want you to be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you know what is right and what is true. You can test and approve that which is good and perfect. And so then in chapter 12, verses 3 through 6, he says, I don't want you to think too highly about yourself. Because one of the things, even as followers of Jesus, we like to do is we like to think pretty highly about ourselves sometimes, where it becomes about us instead of about us together glorifying God. And he says in Romans 12, 9, he says, I want you to love without hypocrisy, not with a mask, love with genuine heart, genuine action, detest the evil, cling to what is good. And then Mark touched on this last week. He, he says in chapter 13, he says, I want you to put on the Messiah. I want you to clothe yourself in Christ, and I want you to walk in love. And he says all these things because he's addressing the body. How do we walk as people following Jesus? And so he begins this by coming to this word in Romans chapter 14 that we read in Romans 15 as well, this word accept. And so what I'd like to do this morning is read four, Romans chapter 14 verses 1 through 12. We're going to look at that for the next few moments here, and then we'll pick up with uh, verse 13 next week. So if, if you would, I invite you to stand with me as we read the scripture this morning. Romans chapter 14 Accept anyone who is weak in faith, but don't argue about doubtful issues. One person believes he may eat anything, but one who is weak eats only vegetables. One who eats must not look down on the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat must not criticize the one who does, because God has accepted him. Who are you to criticize another's household slave? Before his own Lord, he stands or falls, and he will stand for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person considers one day to be above another day. Someone else considers every day to be the same. Each one must be fully convinced in his own mind. Whoever observes the day observes it for the honor of the Lord. Whoever eats, eats for the honor uh, of the Lord. Or, yeah, whoever eats, eats for the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. And whoever does not eat, it is for the Lord that he does not eat. Yet he thanks God, for none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and came to life for this, that he might rule over both the dead and the living. But you, why do you criticize your brother? Or you, why do you look down upon your brother? For we will all stand before the tribunal of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue will give praise to God. 
So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would, that you would teach us what it means to accept one another and to have a relationship with one another that would be for the glory of your son, Jesus. God, I pray that you would show us our own sometimes selfish actions that you might reveal to us how we can walk in love and how we can build up one another. Thank you, God, for your word to us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, a, a couple of things as we jump into this together. Um, the context of the gospel is always that it would go to the nations. All right. Back when um, God came to Abraham, who is the father of the Jewish nation, he said, through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Part of that blessing comes through the seed or through the descendant that would come through Abraham, the Messiah. And one of the things that we find several times in the Hebrew Bible is this um, calling and this purpose that God wants to bring salvation not only to the Jewish people, but also to the Gentiles. And that takes a, a very, you know, it's, it's important to just recognize that as we enter into this discussion. Because the gospel going to the nations was never an afterthought of God. We are called to glorify to God together. But what we are going to talk about this morning is that there are certain things that Christians disagree on. All right? Scripture calls them doubtful issues. How then do we engage as a body of believers when there are things that sometimes we butt heads over? All right? We're just jumping in. Here we go. He says this first in Romans 14. Look with me, please. He says, accept anyone who is weak in faith. All right? Paul, a couple things. First, he's going to use the terms weak and strong in the context of the conversation here. Um, and, and he says, I want you to accept anyone who's weak in faith. So he's talking to the strong in this first uh, sentence. Now, the strong, and let me, do, let me just kind of define this for you. The strong is the person whose conscience permits them to do something as unto the Lord. Okay? A, the strong is a person whose conscience permits them to do something as unto the Lord. Um, the weak, in contrast, is the person whose conscience does not permit them to do that same thing unto the Lord. And next week, we're going to get into some of the specifics in the second part of this chapter and kind of talk through them a little bit and, and get kind of down into the, the, the fine details. But I want to give you that, that, that context, okay? Strong, the person whose conscience says, I'm okay to do this is unto the Lord. The weak, I'm not okay to do this is unto the Lord. What I want you to see first, besides that, is both of these people are followers of Jesus, Okay? They have experienced the same salvation by grace through faith in the Messiah. And so they are brothers or they are sisters in the Lord. All right? That is not in doubt. Everyone is saved. If, if you are saved, you're saved by God's redemptive initiative in your life. You've come to the point where you have said, I am a sinner. God, I need a Savior. And you've trusted Jesus and you've trusted his work by dying and rising again for that, for that experience of new life. He's not talking about salvation issues in here. Okay, he's not. He's talking to the body of believers and he's talking about things where the body disagrees with one another. And in the context of the disagreement, he wants them to live for the honor of the Lord in all issues of conscience. Because he says, all will stand before the Lord for judgment. Okay, so God is the judge, we are not. God is the one to whom every believer goes to and is accountable to. But there are things that we find disagreement over, and how do we walk those out? 
Well, he has some words for us. He says, accept anyone who is weak in faith, but do not um, argue about doubtful issues. Okay, so he's telling the strong, the person whose conscience says, I'm okay to do this. He says, I don't want you to judge someone for something that is a doubtful issue. And to the weak, he's going to say, I do not want you to criticize a person who feels freedom to engage in that way as unto the Lord. So this idea of accept, accept anyone who's weak in faith. The word accept here um, is basically the, the ancient way of saying, I want you to get rid of the click, <laughs> all right? You know what clicks are, right? You were once in school, right? <laughs> Um, cliques are groups that become very closed off because, well, here's what we do, and we don't associate with them because they do that, and I don't want any part of that. This is my circle. Don't come into my circle. Whether you're in school, whether you're in work, whether you're in church, there are cliques everywhere. And literally, he, he's saying, I want you to welcome someone into your circle. I want you to welcome your brother, your sister into your circle. I want you to bust the click that says, I can't be with them because they are a brother or they are a sister in Christ. And because of that standing, he says, accept them, accept them. Now, what he is not saying here uh, is, um, well, well, the, the command is particularly to Christians. You know, sometimes you might say, I don't like this person, or I don't think that they dress as the way that they should, or, or they're too stringent in this area of life, or they're too liberal in this area of life. The command is accept them. What brings people together? Jesus does. At the cornerstone of every bit of our relationship within the body of Christ is Jesus. And he says that is sufficient. In other words, uh, Paul is busting this ancient church clique that is going on. Now, he says, accept anyone weak in faith, but don't argue about doubtful issues. So what are doubtful issues? Now, we would probably benefit in some way, shape, or form to have like an exhaustive list from Paul. Hey, here are all the doubtful issues. Here are all the not doubtful issues. Just as a matter of principle, doubtful issues are issues um, <clears throat> that, that, that were important to these early believers, um, but they're not salvific in any way, shape, or form. Doubtful issues are also not things that God's Word clearly teaches on. And so, uh, like, if God's Word were to clearly forbid something, it is clearly forbidden by God's Word. If it were to clearly command something, it is clearly commanded by God's Word. But there, there are issues, and we'll get into them a little bit next week. Issues like days, issues like food, issues like wine— that became hot-button issues for the ancient church in Rome. We'll talk about that a little bit more next week. But these are not salvific in any way. These are not things that God's word clearly forbids or commands. For example, in the early church community, um, they dealt with things like lying, okay? You look at Acts chapter 5, and an eye sense of fire, two people there, they sell a field. They come and they bring the offering to the apostles, and they say, here's all the money for the field, only it's not all the money. <laughs> and so they, they lied. They, they, they lied to, to the apostles. They lied to God, and they experienced judgment because of that. All right? Lying was dealt with pretty, pretty directly there. Uh, another instance in 1 Corinthians 5, um, there is some sexual immorality going on at the church in Corinth. All right? That was one of the things that the church at Corinth especially dealt with in several ways. And, and Paul says, you have this going on within someone's life in your community, and it must stop. So he's not talking about things where it's like, you must not do that. What we're talking about is doubtful issues. Um, he, he's also, you know, another great example of something clearly taught is false teaching. Something that would deny the deity of the Messiah Jesus or deny his humanity or, do not, or deny what he did on the cross. There is a command for leaders within a community in the ancient church and in the modern church to go and to rightly address that biblically. So he's not talking about don't judge those things. What he's saying is don't judge people who differ from you on things that are of secondary um, conscience. Um, for example, uh, you know, one of the things that has been, I, I don't know if it is, you know, 
broad form, but, but dress, you know? Do you wear a suit to church? Or do you wear a not suit to church? <laughs> do you tuck in your shirt? Or do you not tuck in your shirt? When I was at Cedarville University uh, for my undergrad, um, we, we had uh, a dress code, and I really appreciated how the school did this, um, because our dress code was uh, you had to have a collar, and you had to wear khakis or something like that. You couldn't wear jeans at the time, except for on Fridays when you were wearing a basketball shirt, but that's a whole lot more than you needed. Um, but, but they would say, um, we, we want our students to be dressed in a certain way for campus. But here's what they said. They said, this is not an issue of, um, the phrase they used was, this is our institutional preference. <laughs> Basically, we're not commanding this because you're holier because you do this, we're just commanding this because you're coming to school here. Um, you might have that in your work environment. You, you have a certain way you dress. You're a business person and you dress in a suit, coat, and tie. Or you are a doctor and you dress in scrubs. Like you have certain ways that you dress and certain functions because of certain reasons. He's not talking about, um, he's, he's addressing these things where there is freedom and there is play and it's not an issue of uh, biblical needing to be addressed, but some, something that someone has a conscience that is um, free to do this or not free to do this. As I mentioned, there's a melting pot of church culture in this early community. Now, some people, when they look at this passage, they see a strong um, Jew versus Gentile perspective. Uh, you know, th th there's, you get this idea sometimes uh, because of the, dis the discussion of types of food and observance of days that Paul might be trying to address um, the strong as being the Romans and the weak as being the Jews who are trying to be observant to their customs in the way they brought up. I, I don't think that that's necessarily at play. I think it's at play within the conversation, but that's not his point. See, Observant Jews did keep kosher. There were certain foods that they did not eat because of dietary laws found um, in the Torah given to the people of Israel in Leviticus 11. There's also specific observance of days, like Sabbath and the feast, but they're not the only ones in ancient time that had these certain commands. The Egyptians would have a certain diet that they would follow. Um, Romans had their own diet of what they would follow. Now, the Jewish people were among the most stringent, and they would change their fellowship depending upon what else was going on in the community. But it wouldn't just be the Jewish people. You might have God-fearing Gentiles or proselytes to Judaism who, who would want to keep a Torah-observant lifestyle. And then you would have people who grew up in a Gentile, a Roman category, and they're like, but this is what we have been taught, and then this is what we've been taught, and pretty soon you know what you have at your potluck can change how you engage with one another. Paul does not seem to direct this specifically, in my opinion, towards Jews or to Gentiles when he says strong and weak. Strong and weak seem to be relative categories with regard to a person's conscience with debatable issues. And that's, that's foundational. Paul, for example, here's one of the reasons I say this. Paul never commands Jewish background believers to cease living a Torah-observant lifestyle. He, he doesn't do it. He, he doesn't say, Jews, stop being Jews. Moreover, he doesn't say, Gentiles, stop being Gentiles, except for certain things. Except for certain things. Um, in Acts 21, uh, verses 17 through 25, you don't have to turn there, but, but Paul is in Jerusalem, and he has been teaching and he's been sharing the gospel with Gentile people throughout the Roman world. And there are some people who are um, a little bit uh, unnerved because they believe he has been teaching Jewish people not to keep the law of Moses. Well, Paul's there and he's there to celebrate a feast. And so he undergoes um, some ritual purity things before he goes up to the temple. The, the point of it is this. Um, he says, I, you know, the, there are people who walk in our customs. In many ways, uh, this text suggests that Paul kept a Torah-observant lifestyle, but he gives differing commands for Gentile followers of Jesus. Um, for example, in Acts chapter 15, and we find this echoed in Acts 21, there are certain obligations that are placed upon Gentile followers of Jesus. Namely, they are this, don't eat food that is sacrificed to idols, because that's a part of idol worship. 
all right? In the ancient period, that would mark you as going to the temple of a pagan god and you being involved with idol worship. Um, Second, don't eat blood. Don't eat, third, um, uh, meat that is coming from strangled animals and do not engage in sexual immorality. What's interesting is that he does not say, Gentile follower of Jesus, you must become circumcised. He doesn't say it. He, he, he also doesn't command the Jewish person, person, you must now not be circumcised. My, my point is this. In a church that's made up of Jews and Gentiles, how do you know what to follow? Jewish people would grow up in a certain matrix. Circumcision, dietary laws, observing feasts. They do so unto the Lord. Paul never says, stop doing those things. Gentiles, they come from a pagan way of life. And there are certain things that they are supposed to stop. But Paul and the Jerusalem Council never say, we want you to become Jewish. The question is, is how do we put two groups together and have one heart, one mind, one voice in bringing glory to the Lord? Um, and it's challenging sometimes. So look with me, please. All those opening comments were almost up. But um, verse 2 says this, One person believes he may eat anything. The one who is weak eats only vegetables. One who eats must not look down on the one who does not eat. The one who does not eat must not criticize the one who does. See, he's got commands for both. Don't look down for strong people. Don't look down. Weak people don't criticize. Because why? God has accepted him. If God has accepted him, that's sufficient. Who are you to criticize another's household slave? Now, it's interesting here because the Romans would not criticize someone else's slave. All right? You can touch a lot of things, but you cannot touch someone else who is a servant of another master. That master is the only master that person has. He says, don't criticize another's household slave. Before his own Lord, he stands and falls. And he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. So then Paul goes into this discussion of days. One person considers one day to be above another day. Some else, somebody else considers every day to be the same. <coughs> Each one must be fully convinced in his own mind. This is the idea of conscience. You and I, we have to come to the text and say, what does it say? How, how do I live in light of this? How do I understand properly what it means to observe a day? But notice verse 6. Whoever observes the day, observes it for the honor of the Lord. Whoever eats, eats for the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. And whoever does not eat, it is for the Lord that he does not eat it. Yet he thanks God. Now, it's interesting because at the central core of this, there's a command. It's inherent within these couple verses. If you eat, you do it for the Lord. If you don't eat, you what? You do it for the Lord. If you observe a day, what do you do it for? The Lord. If you don't observe that day or lift that up one day above another, who do you do it for? The Lord. What I want you to see is Paul is establishing this theology of whatever you do, he says this elsewhere, whether in word or deed, whatever you eat or drink, do unto the glory of God. The principle that underlines how we treat one another is, all right, how do we glorify God in this together? Which is why I read Romans 15 first. Because if that's not the base for everything we do, then we can bicker about small and large things. All right? He says this in verse uh, 7. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, I, I try to, every time I see a therefore, especially in Romans, I circle it because it's like a summation. Therefore, whether we live or we die, we belong to the Lord. We belong to the Lord. Christ died and came to life for this, that he might rule over both the dead and the living. He says in verse 10, but why, but, but you, why do you criticize your brother? Or you, why do you look down on your brother? All right? Paul never been to the church at Rome. I surmise that, that uh, if he had heard something, maybe he's addressing that a little bit. But I, even as a veteran church planner by this time, I think he'd seen enough of Jews and Gentiles growing up in the faith to know, hmm, this could be a sticky wicket for them. This could be a, a moment in which they, they have challenge. 
And he wants to, them to understand this. Don't criticize. Don't look down upon someone because they disagree from you in a doubtful issue. Non-doubtful issues, you take the word of God to them and you say, here's what scripture says. Can we follow it together? But where there's issues of doubt, where there is play, where, where there is question, it's we do it as unto the Lord. He says this in the latter part of verse 10, for we will all stand before the tribunal or the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue will give praise to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. One of the things I think that's helpful for us to remember is that one day we give an account to God. I give an account to God. You give an account to God. Right? God will deal with me one day in some ways, I'm sure, with grace because of a relationship that I have been saved and redeemed by grace through faith, not of works. These are not works that save us. We're saved by the grace of God through the redemption that comes through Jesus. But I'm sure at some point in time, God's going to say, this right here, you may have missed the mark on that. I know that there's many things actually God will say that to me for. <laughs> Maybe less for you. How would our life look if we lived with this recognition that God would be our judge and our brother's judge? I think it might change some of how we live. There are four principles I want to give you as I bring this to a close. Principle number one, doubtful issues must never divide God's people. Doubtful issues must never divide God's people. If God has accepted someone, we are called to accept them as well. That's principle number one. Principle number two is this. We'll talk about this more next week. The strong must not look down on the weak. And the weak must not criticize the strong. Very, very challenging words for us in a day filled sometimes with contention. The strong must not look down on the weak. The weak must not criticize the strong. That's principle number two. Principle number three. Each person is accountable to the Lord. Therefore, live your life for the Lord. Have a heart have a mindset that says, God, how would I please you today? Have an openness to God's spirit to lead and guide you and to correct you. When we are open to God's correction, we live for the Lord. We allow our hearts and our lives to be redirected in a way that might be self-focused for a time to something that's much more redemptive, not only for the community, but for the world. Number four, as Christians... Our one mind or one purpose, you could translate it both ways, uh, is to glorify God together. And this is a good diagnostic question for daily decisions. Is my desire in this to glorify God together with my brothers and sisters in the Lord? It's really easy sometimes to say, mm, I disagree, and to push people away. The picture God has for the church is that they would be a people who would accept, accept one another. Now, this does also not mean that we do not engage about doubtful issues, right? It is good to engage on doubtful issues. It is good to challenge one another and say, here's what I read in the text and here's how I understand it. Sometimes you're going to agree to disagree. The big point though is whatever you do, do unto the Lord. Have a conscience that is clear before the Lord. Now, we're going to jump into some details of that next week. Hope you come back. Hope you join us again online. For what does it mean to look at some of these things and say, what does it mean to walk in this manner? I'll leave you with this. Whatever we do, we do for the Lord. May that be the heart that we have this week as we engage one another and as we engage our world. Let's pray. Our Father and our King, in a world that can have great divisiveness, we want to have the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace to reign in our hearts. 
God, I pray that you would teach us what it means to love you. I pray, God, that you would teach us what it means to follow you and to accept one another, especially those with whom we have disagreements about various issues. I pray, God, that you would give us a sensitivity of heart to listen and to yield where possible for the glory of God in our world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, we want to glorify our our Heavenly Father. And I just want to lead us in prayer. Father, um, thank you for this great blessing of these funds as we anticipate the sale of our property. And Father, our goal, our desire as elders and as a church would be to bring great glory and honor to you Our desire would be to make the name of Jesus great in our community and around the world. And so, Father, I would pray that you would give us wisdom and understanding as a congregation, as elders, and that we would have unity as we press forward. And, Father, I understand that we have different ideas and different opinions, but somehow, Father, through your Holy Spirit, would you give us great unity in this. And I pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.